running late just a little bit, okay? But um, I appreciate everybody that showed up in person, everybody that's going to show up uh, through the live stream. We are actually streaming through a couple of different platforms. We're streaming through our own um, SWAC uh, platform at livestream.com. We are also streaming live via Facebook. Um, from um, our social media page. So there are multiple avenues for people to uh, experience tonight's events. I am so excited. All right, so I wanted to put down this so that we see it. Um, I don't know if it comes very uh, well, very over um, on the camera, but um, tonight's event is sponsored by the New Archaeology Club on campus. Bay Area Archaeology, uh, and they do have a Venmo. It's Bay underscore area underscore archaeology. Uh, if you feel so inclined to help us uh, move forward and have more of these types of events, all of the money will go directly to the club and to the students to um, help sponsor events um, like more speakers, um, other types of field trips, um, and even artifacts for the students to enjoy. So tonight, I am a little bit excited. Okay, so uh, Dr. John Shea. Professor Shea is a professor of anthropology at Stony Brook University. Uh, he specializes in stone tool archaeology, stone tool uh, lithics, um, how do you use them, how do you make them. Uh, if you have watched um, a TV show or a documentary that has talked about stone tools in the last 20 years, his face was probably in it. Okay. Um, so he so graciously, uh, I emailed him sort of out of the blue and said, hey, we are a little community college here in Coos Bay, Oregon. Would you be willing to come and uh, talk to my students? And he said, well, I'm in New York. So uh, we set up this um, streaming service, um, which was a little more out of my week because I didn't know much about it. So I really want to thank our IT department here at the college um, for really helping us out to make this happen. Okay. With that, I will uh, send it over to Dr. Shea. He is, he is going to talk about some of his current research. Um, and I want to do this so that we have a chance, all the students here um, give a chance to uh, actually ask uh, Professor Shea some questions. So he's going to talk a little bit, and then we'll have uh, some time definitely to um, ask some questions. Right. Uh, and please make sure that you got one of his papers. And if you are on the live stream and you do want a copy of uh, Survival Archaeology uh, by Professor Shea, please email me. Um, I would be happy um, to pass that along. Okay. So without further ado, Professor John Shea. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for introducing me. I, is, is the sound coming through all right? Yes, yes, you sound great. All right. Um, yeah, I'm the stone tools guy. Okay. You know, I've, I've written a lot about stone tools. I started making and using stone tools when I was about 11. I'm 63, yeah, 63 now. So it's, I've probably made, been making stone tools longer than most, most uh, Pleistocene humans lived. So <laughs> I'm not, it's not a claim to expertise. It's just, you know, it shows you I've got nothing better to do with my time. Um, about 10 years ago, I had a rethinking about the stone tools business. I was sitting in a scientific meeting and my colleagues were arguing about who made this kind of stone tool and how many different kinds of stone tool industries there were. And I had an epiphany. The epiphany was that I was bored and my legs still worked. So I just got up and left. I said, but, you know, th th there's got to be a better way. And maybe it's a midlife crisis. Maybe it's, it's just, you know, getting in touch with my roots, getting in touch with my heritage. And I decided that the, uh, I take a different path. I, I finish out the stone tools business. I wrote three books on them, you know, one about the Near East, one about human evolution, one about Eastern Africa. And I just thought, you know, to have a fresh perspective, to put the stone tools and other things in context. And um, partly, again, I said midlife crisis, I decided to do a bunch of these survival classes out West, you know, learning how to, you know, 
go out for 11 days out in the wilderness in northern Arizona, you know, live by your, 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 your hands and, and, and make your own tools and this kind of thing. It, it occurred to me, you know, these are the kinds of things I did when I was a kid. And, you know, it, it struck me, we, we archaeologists spent a lot of time constructing these stories about who, who made which stone tools, who ran across this part of the planet at, w- at what point. But we really don't know very much about how they lived, how people avoided things like you know freezing to death or starving or drowning. Um, so I, I started thinking about survival, the, the survival stuff I was doing on my own. And I decided that, well, maybe this is a, a, a new approach. And I'm honored to be, have been invited to speak to you. This is um, what we call in, in the business a book talk. This is, you know, an overview of a, of a book I've, I've, I've written and it will be published next, uh, later this month called um, The Unstoppable Human Species. It's a popular science work that pulls together um, some of the survival things I've been doing for, for the last, well, God, 50, 50, 40 odd years, together with my experience as an archaeologist. And, and I, I appreciate your invitation. I welcome your questions. I, my wife, who is behind me at the end of the house, just says, John, slow down. You, you talk very quickly. I'm from Boston, or just north of it, up near Salem, and, and people from that part of the country, we speak very quickly. So uh, as the slide colors change, those are cues to me to stop and ask if you have questions. So um, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to move to share screen right now. Bear in mind, I'm a, this definitely a low-tech kind of guy, so I hope this works. <laughs> All right, let's get this up here. And share screen. Um, Dana, you need to disable, uh, you need to re-enable um, screen sharing. Okay, give it a shot, John. I know. There we go. There we go. Right home. So the title of this particular lecture is How Ancestral Africans Survived. And um, we are all basically descendants of ancestral Africans. Now, for, for a while there, you know, Professor Gates at Harvard uh, was, was running this, this show. He still does. You know, Finding Your Roots. And and uh, my, my, my best friend who passed away last year, Isaiah Nengo, is a Kenyan scholar. He said, you know, we've been calling each other brothers by different mothers. Let's go to Skip's office and, and he'll do that, you know, chase us back to our last common ancestor who lived in Kenya 300,000 years ago. It never came to pass, but it did get me thinking, you know, about the larger questions in human evolution. You know, and, and not just who's descended from whom, but why us? If you look back at the, at the paleoanthropological record, let me stop. You know, there's a lot of text in these, 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 these slides, and that's because I have a, my students will tell you a tendency to digress. These are like cue cards in the old days. Keep me on topic. So, you know, it, it, of, of all the great questions, the big questions we ask, and, and life is too short to spend your, your time answering small questions. Of all the big questions, of all those African hominids, the dozens and dozens that populate the world two million years ago, why is it that only we, Homo sapiens, survived and sailed the rest of the world? How do you get from you know, a half dozen or more early hominids to only one of us, one, walking on the moon? Now, having looked at studying human origins research for a long time, I've come to a, a rather disappointing conclusion, but it's also an optimistic conclusion. The, the pessimistic aspect of this is that traditional approaches to this evidence, they just aren't going to answer this question about of why us. They can't. All they give us are, are arguments. And these arguments are not hypotheses. An argument is what you think, what you feel. An hypothesis is something you can prove wrong with evidence, conclusively, to the exclusion of alternative hypotheses. So what I'm doing in, in, in this presentation, in my recent book, and I you hope know, what remains of my career, is that I try to answer that question. Why us? So first, I want to give you a little thought experiment. Okay, this, this may strike you as, as funny or odd, but trust me, I live in New Mexico, this stuff happens all the time. So you and your friend, you're out hiking in the wilderness. You're a long way from home. 
You, you find yourself out of cell phone range and against all advice, literally all advice about wilderness survival, you didn't bring a knife, you didn't bring matches, you didn't bring a first aid kit, and you have only enough water for a day. If this sounds unrealistic, trust me on this. It happens all the time. My neighbors in, in Santa Fe, they're on the search and rescue. They, they do not lack for business. <laughs> People do this stuff all the time. In fact, there's a, there's a whole book, and I recommend this. Get it from your library because it's wicked expensive. It's wicked. Uh, it, it, it's a New England thing. Um, it's very expensive. It's called Lost Person Behavior. This book is the best study of human behavior, behavioral variability ever put to print. It's an emergency manual. So basically, if you're a sheriff, if you're an essay, a search and rescue person, and you got a case, you got somebody, an elder person or a little kid, you know, lost. You get this book, you open it up, and it guides you right through. This is statistically what they're likely to do, what they're less likely to do, and, and it, it helps you, you know, bring them home, you know, walking rather than in a bag. So, it, it, add this to your reading list. I think it's, it, it's it's one of the best books I've ever read. So, you're out there in the wilderness. Your friend sprains sprains their ankle. They can't walk. So what do you do? Night's coming. So if you if you study this stuff, you know you're gonna set priorities. First one is first aid. So you you don't have a, a steel knife. So fortunately, you're a graduate of my stone tools and primitive technology class. So you you make a stone tool and you cut some bark band aids. You strip some bark off a tree to make make uh, you know a, comp a comp compression bandage to help your friend's ankle to set it so they can move about in comfort. Now, night's coming. It's going to get cold. So what you do, you get some, you, you use your stone tool to cut some brush, get some, some vegetation between you and the ground to minimize heat loss to conduction, and you, you, you put some brush in, in a windbreak to minimize heat loss to convection. You, you're trying to stave off hypothermia. Hypothermia can kill in minutes. Most of the people who died in the Titanic, they didn't die by drowning, they died by, from hypothermia. Kills very, very fast. Okay. So, okay, you've got first, first aid and shelter. What's next? So you use your stone tool to make a digging stick. Digging with stone tools is a lot of work. It's very hard. The digging stick gives you leverage. So you cut a branch, you make a digging stick, and you dig a, dig a well next to the water source, either in a, in a dry river bed or, you know, 10, 15 odd meters away from the edge of a lake. Make a, make a, a, a well Get the water out. And if you're smart, you've got some halozone tablets to, to drop in there, or you've got some 2% tincture of iodine. Drops, drop five uh, drops into one liter, and you're good to go. It, it tastes horrible, but it won't kill you. Okay. So food. Now, you know, if, if you're in an overnight situation, you don't eat food. You're good for days, not weeks without food. It's not going to be pleasant, but you don't eat food. On the other hand, food is food as, as a morale booster. You don't really need, stone, need many stone tools to, to collect food, but again, anything that helps builds morale and, and helps everybody you know, survive better. Okay, now moving. This is a, a, a crucial decision. The best case scenario is, is if you're lost, stay put. People will find you. If you start moving, you increase the search radius. People are gonna spend a lot more time, air time and ground time trying to find you. But if you gotta move, if some, if, 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 you know, then you use your stone tools to make a travois, you know, a, a, a carrying device, like shown in the upper picture here. You know, as you move, it's important to help search and rescue people find you. So people don't make stone tools anymore. So one way to, to help search and rescue people find you is bang rocks together. Number one, it's a distinctive noise. Number two, it scares away carnivores. You know, you know you've got a coyote or a mountain lion around, bang rocks together. They'll turn tail and run. More to the point, since people don't make stone tools, that's a very clear sign of, of, of humans. So kind of like Hansel and Gretel in the old German folktale, you leave stone tools at intervals, you leave stone tools on a trail behind you. So this is a, a help to finding, finding, help people find you. And you know what? In your scenario, it works. You get rescued. People find you. And, you know, you get on the television, you see this all the time. You know, a person lost in the wilderness for three days, they survive, this kind of thing. You know, you're now a survival expert. And the media being what the media is, you know, they're gonna, you're going to get book offers, you get movie deals, you're going to get invited to host reality television programs. You're the king of the world. Now, any questions so far? Anything at all? 
I'm going to move the, open up the chat thing so I can see. Anybody had a question? Yeah, you guys got any questions so far? Nicole, you got a question for me? I got one. Okay, what's great. The, what's the best way to, if you are lost, signal? Uh, maybe like an airplane flying over or a helicopter, some type of rescue like that. Did what you do you want to do? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you if, if you get fire, you want to make smoke, you know, white smoke and or, or black smoke. If you're near a car, you know there's plenty of things that will burn black. Um, basically, your, your your simplest solution to that is is a, a reflective lens, um, a, a mirror basically with a with a hole a perforation in the center that allows you to sight on the aircraft. You know, um, there's many ways to signal aircraft. You can leave signs. Um, what I do in Eastern Africa when I'm exploring and, and looking for sites is if I change my, my uh, direction of travel, I leave a series of rocks, one rock, then three rocks, then five rocks pointing in the direction of my travel. That, those are three prime numbers. Nature hates prime numbers. So it, it's a good way for me to signal to anybody's looking for me. That's the direction in which I'm traveling. But, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's move. Let's move on here. I want to be. Uh, I'll uh, move this thing over here. All righty. So, the scenario I gave you is what would happen if you did this today. Now, imagine you did this four million years ago, and, you, and, and paleoanthropologists found those stone tools you left behind. So, what would happen? Well. I tell you, as an archaeologist, the first thing they try to do is assign the stone tools they found to one of these named stone tool industries, the Old Water or Lamechian or Proto Lamechian or Proto Old Water, this, this kind of thing. And then my colleagues in paleontology, they spend all kinds of time trying to figure out which hominid made these tools. Now, they don't know what you are, who you are. They, they Maybe this Artipithecus made these tools or Kenya Anthropus or Australopithecus. They, they spent immense amounts of time trying to link your tools to one of these hominids. And why? They do this because these linkages between stone tools and hominid species. Hominids are basically bipedal primates, so Australopithecus, Homo, Artipithecus, those creatures. <clears throat> they use those linkages to, to look for evolutionary milestones, major things that changed in the course of human evolution. And they also use them to plot our earlier hominins and our ancestors, geographic movements. So how do they move around? And they express these, these hypotheses as arrows on maps. Now, here's the thing. Unless you can actually observe extinct hominins making these tools and moving around, all these arguments about which hominins made which artifacts and which arrows on the maps are correct are impossible to prove wrong. You can't prove them wrong without a time machine. And as far as I understand physics, and I'm not that smart a guy, backwards time travel is impossible. So these aren't hypotheses, these are arguments. Now, a lot of these arguments about who made which tools are, are based on somebody found a stone tool in the same level of, of a sedimentary deposit as a, as, you know, as a hominin fossil. Fossils plus artifacts in the same deposit don't indicate who made the tools. All they indicate is that the, the, a, a hominid fossil and a stone tool were deposited at around the same time. Now, that doesn't mean at the same moment. That doesn't mean at the same reason, for the same reason. What it means is there's a certain amount of time during which hominid fossils and stone tools were being deposited. They could be there for a connector reason or for, for co pure coincidence. Many of these levels in archaeological sites uh, in, in deep time ranges, you know, a million years ago or, or more. Um, they sample decades or even centuries. So just because someone finds a stone tool next to a, a hominin fossil doesn't mean the hominin made the stone tool. It could, could mean somebody used the stone tool to butcher the hominin. <laughs> so um, this this argument, this idea that you can answer who made which tools based on uh, a stratigraphy is wrong, or at least open to alternative interpretations. So when you get right down to it, arguments about which hominins which made which stone tools, they're basically the, the scientific equivalent of a children's game. Pin the tail of the donkey. You probably, you probably all played this game when you were kids. You know, 
it's a lot more fun when you play it as adults with, with the prize being a drink at the end. <laughs> but it, it's, it's boisterous fun as children, but it's not that dignified a game to play in science. Now, whenever we get new fossils, new archaeology, basically it's a new game using different pins and slightly different donkeys. And if you think about it, if, if who made which tools is anybody's guess, why bother guessing? You can't prove these hypotheses wrong or or to the exclusion of alternative hypotheses. What I'm doing in, in, in my own work from here on outwards is I'm exploring a better, what I think is a better approach. Now, I call it survival archaeology, and it focuses on what I like to call how questions. Not questions about who made the tools and who, who ran over, across this part of the landscape you know, following a, a hypothetical arrow, but how questions about how people overcame survival challenges. How questions lead to actual hypotheses. Hypotheses are statements about, about the evidence that you can prove wrong. These are actual hypotheses, and, and as a consequence, this is actual science. Now, does, does anyone have any questions at all before I go further? Any questions at all? Dana, I hope you'll intervene, because if I break screen sharing here, I'm going to get lost in the technology. No, no, absolutely, John. Um, and we, do, we are monitoring um, the live feed on Facebook. So if you do have a question and you're on Facebook, uh, through Facebook Live watching us, please uh, write a comment um, or a question and uh, that'll be related uh, to us. Um, I don't have a question. Um, you know, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, who pinned the tail on the donkey, who, you know, the, the, uh, the question arises uh, so much of you know, who, which hominins made this particular stone tool. Um, and it does uh, bring to mind, of course, um, the whole ancient aliens um, <laughs> craze, I would say, that's come uh, upon us in the last, um, you know, 15 years. Um, I, I took a, a graduate course in pseudo-archaeology um, when, I, when I was a graduate student um, by um, Dr. Charles Orser. And uh, just a, it was a such a fantastic look at um, our our interest in wanting that question answered and to get an answer by any means possible. And I was wondering, well, what sort of what do you think about the whole um, aliens hypothesis? That's a, it's just a modern metaphor. It's the same sort same sort of thing as as you know angels and gods and. You know, uh, Southwest Asian, you know, yeah, super, super that's natural that's theories. There's just as much uh, evidence um, either way, right? There's no evidence in either case. Evidence, yes, right? No, it's just, uh, it, 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 I, you know, it's, I'm not going to impugn any particular religion, but the idea that there are supernatural en entities that, you know, that you know came down and, and created humans and, and gave us ten commandments, but but which to ignore, whatever we, we could get away with it, this kind of business that that has no more you know, more scientific and evidentiary foundation than the idea that people from from Alpha Centauri came here and you know created humans and gave us ten commandments, the rest of it. it the, the ancient alien stuff is a modern metaphor. It's it's just it's basically the same sort of thing. You know, to, it, it, exporting the, the the cause and agency of our own evolution to some um, un, unfalsifiable argument about about um, another cause. You know, unless you know, unless these aliens land their spaceship on the White House lawn, I'm skeptical. <laughs> it's 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 you know, it's in the same same. This is entertainment. This isn't serious science. I don't know a single scientist who doesn't, you know, we look at this ancient alien stuff and we're, we're too lazy to get up off the couch and change the channel. <laughs> it's so entertaining, isn't it? No, it's, it's disgraceful. It's Sorry, disgraceful. For the moment, I just have a, Professor Shane, while you're doing the Q&A, if you would turn off your screen sharing, we would be able to see your marvelous right, let, me, let me give that a shot. Okay. All right, John. Oops, no, that's not good. Yeah. Oh. Give me a moment. No worries. If you're done with the Q and A in this section too, just when that's happening, it will, we'll see the when you ah. share. There you go. I just stop. I just stop sharing. Go right ahead. There you are. Thank you, sir. Okay. okay. No. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So now you can start sharing again and and continue on. Right. All right. <laughs> Play with me, are you? All right. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, that's what we do here. All right, so let's continue. 
here in Cuban, so. So, my alternative is survival archaeology. So, what's survival archaeology? What questions do we ask? We ask how questions. So, we ask, how did hominins, or our ancestors, and others who aren't, how do they overcome survival challenges? And survival archaeology uses contemporary sources of information to develop hypotheses and, and test those hypotheses using archaeological evidence. It's, it's basic science. You can't use the archaeological record as both the source of your hypotheses and the evidence by which you try to falsify those hypotheses. It's circular reasoning. So th there's all manner of, of, of interesting sources of information about this. Um, but it, the guiding principle, the principle that underlies surviving archaeology is, is basically evolution. You know, if what works well persists, what doesn't work well doesn't persist. And um, the major questions are, what, what are the survival challenges and what sources of information do we use to develop hypotheses about them? And this, this, the pictures off the, off the uh, right end of the screen here are interesting. That's a picture of, of 1960s astronauts undergoing survival training in Panama, just in case the Mercury or Gemini space capsules went off course and, and the astronauts had to evacuate and, and, and uh, survive on the ground. They underwent training in Panama with expert, you know, bushcraft uh, trainers and this sort of thing. And the man at the left is an, a Panamanian indigenous person who's taught, was teaching these astronauts. That's um, from left to right, Neil Armstrong, John Glenn Jr., Gordo Cooper, and Pete Conrad, those of you who grew up in the 1960s, those names will resonate for you. And at the, the lower end, decades later, these are students in the Alder Leaf Wilderness College in Washington State, near you, I gather, um, under, using some of the very same techniques. These techniques for survival, they persist because they work. So where, what, are the, what, are, are, what are our sources and what are the challenges? So let's let's look at the, the first. Let's look at the challenges for short-term survival. We we just went over them in that scenario I talked to you about. So your first challenge in a survival emergency is circulation, airways, and 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 blood. You've got less than three minutes. If somebody's got a, 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 a wound on the femoral artery, a you know, major bleeding, they've got an obstructed airway. You got three minutes before you start losing losing. Uh, you know, uh, excuse, excuse me. You start learning brain, losing brain function. Secondly, thermoregulation or shelter. So you've got to avoid hy hyperthermia, and most importantly, you've got to avoid hypothermia, you know, exposure or death by, by uh, excessive cooling. It's really hard to die of hyperthermia. You've got to work at it. Hy hypothermia, it can kill you in minutes. I've been in three situations of field work where I got hypothermic, you know, and, and, and that's not fun. You know, we start realizing, you know, you got minutes to, to solve this problem. So water, you know, water, people underestimate this and again and again and again. And the, search, the Santa Fe search and rescue guys down the street from me, you know, yep, we pulled another one off the mountain. How much water do they have? Thimble, you know, the, people, for water, you got less than three days. Always have a means by which to have water, if not to have water on you, then to make water potable from natural sources. Don't drink exposed water out west. It's all full of giardia from livestock. It'll kill you. Um, so food, food, food's kind of overrated. You really don't need to waste a lot of time looking for food. It's a morale booster, as I said before, but you know, you get, you get days, if not weeks before, you know, you, you start suffering the ill effects of, of um, insufficient food. Signaling and, and, and uh, moving, so communication and transportation, the urgency of these things varies depending on your situation. There's no real rule. You know, there, there have been people who've survived for, for months. There's an example here at the, at the right-hand side, you know, the, the endurance expedition uh, headed by Captain Ernest Shackleton, they survived for years. So, you know, the, the, these are, it's difficult to put a, a, a time frame on the urgency of those. Now, I'm focusing in right now on, on short-term survival challenges because there, there are others. The long-term ones, the matters, the, the matter in evolutionary time scales are things like finding mates, forming alliances. And my old professor of DeVore used to say, John, a lone baboon is a dead baboon. And Professor DeVore always used to refer to his colleagues as, you know, college professors, John, they're just baboons in Tweety, Tweety suits. So having a having allies is an important survival strategy. And lastly, raising children, because fundamentally in evolution, if you don't, if, if you don't raise kids, you're invisible. So 
these are the, 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 uh, the short-term survival challenges. First aid, shelter, water, food, signaling, and, and, and moving in approximate order of priority. So, excuse me. What are our sources of hypotheses? We know the other problems. How do we find out solutions to them? The major sources I've, I've, I've suggested my, we should look at and, and uh, are, are range from ones that my colleagues already use to ones that are less explored. So ethnography and ethnoarchaeology. This is ethnography is the study of living people and ethnoarchaeology are studies of living people conducted by archaeologists focusing in on their, their material culture, their, their tools. Um, their diets, their settlement patterns, these sorts of things. Um, bushcraft and wilderness survival, these are strategies for surviving in the wilderness or using less than advanced techniques for uh, overcoming obstacles in, in, in um, wilderness settings. Um, experimental archaeology, um, I've been doing this God, since I, I was a little kid, you know, making stone tools and seeing how they work and different tasks. And non-human primate ethology, studies of, of, of living non-human primate behavior, those studies can give us some ideas about what were the the uh, the, the starting point, what, what our uh, last common ancestors between us and the African apes had in their uh, survival toolkit before they differentiated from one another five to seven million years ago. Um, ethnography, ethnoarchaeology, experimental archaeology, and to a lesser degree, the non-human primate ethology. Archaeologists use this, these sources a lot, but for one reason or another, they really don't connect with the bushcraft and wilderness survival communities. And there's complicated reasons for that. But if people are curious, I could, I could, you know, hold my, my opinions about it. But what I'm trying to do is, is to drag this, this, uh, bushcraft and wilderness survival information into archaeology. There's a, there's a lot there. And, and, and uh, these are, some of these are skill, ancestral skills. Some of them are newly developed. But I think they can shed a lot of uh, important light on how our ancestors went from being just one, among many African primates to being the unstoppable human species. So I'm going to pause now and ask for questions. The, the, uh, the change in the color of the slides is my cue. My wife would say, slow down, John, ask for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I'll stop sharing so I can hear or see. Perfect. I have a question. Taylor? Please. Um, so how do you clean water if you don't have anything that's on you? You just have to boil it. Okay. Um, boiling is the, the simplest. If you've got a means to start fire, you know, boil it for, for a couple of minutes. You know, um, the longer you boil it, it's really five, five minutes is overkill. Um, two minutes is probably sufficient for most. What you want to do is, is, is filter it. Um, you get all the particulate matter out. So a handkerchief over a water bottle, pour the water through the handkerchief, that'll filter out the, the, the larger particles. But there's still microorganisms in there that can really, really uh, mess you up. So pour the water through a handkerchief, filter it. Um, if, if you can boil it, if you've got fire, boil it. If you don't have fire, then the, your, your best bet are either halazone or, or uh, tablets or my preferred solution is, is uh, five to six drops of, of uh, two percent tincture of iodine per about per one uh, liter of water. Two percent tincture of iodine. It's a little, it comes in a little bottle. It's good for about six years. Um, just you know, you keep it keep it cool. Throw it in your backpack, and and uh, you, you you five or six drops into a, a, a liter, a, a plastic liter. You know, agitate it. If the clearer it is, the le you know the less the less time you need to wait. I wait about 30, 30 minutes to an hour before I drank anything. Um, yeah, that, that's, 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 that's the simple solution. Making fire to boil water is great, but it takes, it, you're going to burn up lots of calories making fire unless you've got matches or some other artificial fire making aid, like a ferrous cerium rod or those, uh, you know, flint and steel things they show in Survivor, um, magnesium block with a, with a ferrous cerium rod in them. Um, that's what I carry with me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I bring, a I bring a ferro rod. And, and, and a tinder and, and, and a tinder and a, a, a Altoids tin uh, for the backcountry stuff. But you can do it. it, it and, and, you know, boiling is the simplest solution. We, 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 when we work in Eastern Africa, our cook and our, our, our base camp crew, they spend much of the day when we're out looking for fossils and stuff, boiling water. So we come back and there's, you know, a 20 gallon drum full of, of boiled water and you just shake it a little bit to get, get you know, make it more, more, more digestible. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. Okay. If if you want a really good reference on this stuff, um, there's a there's a book. Uh, 
My phone name Cody, C-O-D-Y, London, L-U-N-D-I-N. Um, it's called uh, 98.6, <laughs> The Art of Keeping Your Ass Alive. Huh? Yeah, Cody's, okay. a, a, Cody's a, a, a survival instructor and runs a place called the uh, Aboriginal Living Skills School in Prescott, Arizona. Um, he's one of the best. And that that little book, it's 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 you know, ten fifteen dollars. It's probably the best survival book out there. It has all this information about water and temperature regulation. Um, if I had if I had to pick you know, three books, that'd be the for my first choice. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Shall we move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. So let's see here. Uh, share screen. Yeah, there's the man himself in the orange there. <laughs> it's a weird book, but it's got more more informa valuable information per page than than, than uh, dozens of others. Okay, so what are your ancestral survival skills? And there's a reason I'm not using an acronym for this. <laughs> My wife's like, "Oh, John, no." <laughs> you know, the, your ancestral survival skills, the things that got your ancestors from being one among you know, a dozen. You know, promising primates in Africa to being, you know, the, the unstoppable species. They're not exotic bushcraft stuff. It's not how to make fire. It's not how to dig a snow cave. It's not how to drink your own pee. Don't drink your own pee. You'll, you'll just destroy your kidneys. And basically, don't do anything. Don't bear grills tells you to do. <laughs> so these are skills we all have. Oh, you have them right now. You, you might have the same words for them as, as I do, but but you all possess them, and you can all improve them if you practice. So the first of these is powerful precision grasping. The second is, this is academic jargon, but it's predictive hallucination. I'll explain it a little bit here. Third of these is in, endurance bipedalism. The fourth, spoken language, something we're doing right now. And, and the last of these is a bit more obscure, but I'll, I'll get to it. It's called hyper, so above, Pro-sociality. Now, primates are social creatures. Many mammals are social creatures. Pro-sociality means you're, you, you, you seek out mem other members of your own species. Hyper-pro-sociality means you are willing to incur a cost, a significant cost, in order to interact with other members of your own species. Now, I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but you're all college students. You're paying tuition. That's hyper-pro-sociality. So... Let's move along here. So powerful precision grasping. This essentially means being able to grasp an object with, you know, a small object with or, or larger between your fingertips and manipulate it with power. Now, the good examples of this of driving a screw or, you know, percussion-based stone working. That's, that's me about 40 years ago in the middle of making stone tools in Kenya. Um, the, the first evidence, rather the oldest evidence we have of this dates to between two and a half and, and three and a half million years ago. And it's, it's combined evidence from the fossil record. So enlarged thumbs, big, big thumbs like we have, unlike apes thumbs are you know, one half this size. So these big and large thumbs together with, with, with the tendons allow you to do powerful grasping. Um, around the same time, two and a half to three and a half billion years ago, we also find evidence of stone tools, small stone tools being used to cut uh, flesh off of animal bones. So this is powerful precision grasping. That's one of your ancestral skills. You all have it right now. If you're using a pencil, you're, you're using it right now, or a pen. Now, predictive hallucination, this is a bit of a euphemism, but essentially what it means is being able to make accurate predictions about reality from facts that aren't in the evidence. So if you're tracking an animal, all you have are the tracks. You see some indentations on the ground, and and uh, you you know if you, if you learn and know what you're doing, you can say, okay, that, that, that split hoof, that's food, you know, paws with claws, that, that that's trouble. But but you know the animal isn't present, and so the the, the knowledge there, being able to predict what, what's going on based on the tracks, is an example of predictive hallucination. But there's a more common example: you're driving down the street and you see a sign that five miles per hour. You know, uh, speed limit, watch for children. Do you see kids? Almost never. You, you predictively hallucinate. What will I do if a kid goes running out in front of the car? That's predictive hallucination. You know, it's hard to fix this one in terms of antiquity. But when we see hominins, you know, fossil, excuse me, when we see again and again in the archaeological record, evidence that hominins were knocking down large animals, 
zebra, wildebeest, these kinds of creatures that uh, will flee from them. And we find such remains far away from water holes where these animals died. And we infer that the hominins were, were following them somehow, either tracking them by looking at the tracks or using other clues. Like uh, when vultures, vultures will circle for, for a, a long time when they spawn an animal that, that's on its last legs. So that's, those are examples of predictive hallucination in the, in the environment in which our ancestors evolved. All righty, where are we at here? Okay, so the, the, the other ones here, you know, the third, endurance bipedalism. Now, I'm sure it's many of you run or jog and this kind of thing, but um, if, if you ever look at how well humans run compared to how other primates run, we're off the charts. You know, a, a, a chimpanzee, you cannot outrun a chimpanzee. If a chimpanzee is chasing you, you're dead. A chimpanzee would not survive the first half hour of a marathon. Now, some of this, much of this has to do with how we walk around. We, we walk on, by, on two legs, they walk on four. And so whenever they, they lurch forward, their guts slam into the diaphragm and drive the air out of their, their lungs. Whereas we stand upright and when we, we run, our guts pull down and, and help us aspirate and you know, breathe in air more efficiently. Uh, humans routinely outrun other animals. This is this, the photograph on, on the left is my dear old friend and, and colleague, Professor Dan Lieberman from Harvard University, about to win the man versus horse race in Prescott, Arizona, in which humans on foot, you know, Dan is running, and he said, look like he has shoes on there, but he usually runs this race barefoot. You know, they compete against uh, riders on horses. Routinely, human runners outrun the horses. We are really good at running, and part of that also allows us to, to swim long distances. We can run, swim, and walk, and carry things in our, our arms for hours. We don't have to use our arms to carry to, as, as locomotion. We don't, unlike apes, we don't have to walk around on our arms, our hands. So these are things that start to show up in the archaeological record between 1.6 and 1.8 million years ago with a reorganization of, of, of limb lengths. We basically, you know, early members of the, of the genus Homo have relatively short arms and, and long legs, whereas other primates have, you know, apes have uh, long legs and, excuse me, long arms and, and short legs. So the fourth of these is spoken language. Now, spoken language, and, and, and simply put, is distinct vocalizations expressed rapidly with syntax and grammar. There's an active debate about you know, you know, whether syntax how syntax evolved or whether it was innate or whether it's something co-opted from pre-existing structures. But the, the point of uh, the more important point is that being able to speak is literally an ability to die for. I don't know if any of you have ever choked on food, but thousands of people every year in the United States choke on food. They choke on food because unlike other mammals, our upper respiratory tract makes a really abrupt right angle shift between our, our mouths and our, our, our throat. That allows food particles to get lodged back there. That sharp angulation and, and basically our very weird shaped heads compared to other mammals or small faces, uh, you know, uh, this sort of thing. Um, this allows us to talk with rapid, talk rapidly and with short, distinct bursts of sound, something that um, other primates can't do. Now, there have been a few primatologists who taught uh, chimpanzees to, uh, to, to make, you know, um, monosyllabic you know, utterances like cup or Oop, or this sort of thing, but um, no ape has ever read the Gettysburg Address. So <laughs> this is our ability to speak and communicate. Is, is it provides us a tremendous advantage because essentially it's, it's like the difference between a standalone computer and network computer. We can share information across, you know, from one individual to another, and you know, aided by artifacts, writing these sorts of things, we can share information across generations. I can quote Shakespeare, a fellow who, who died 500 years ago. You know, um, we few, we happy few, we band our brothers. For he who sheds his day, his blood with me this day shall he, shall he be he near so vile, but gentle as condition. And um, and gentlemen in England will think themselves accursed, who were not who were not here with us this day. Something something same Christmas Day. That that's um, that speech, and and uh, it's something that uh, is uniquely derived. In our species, the, th the thing about detecting speech is tough because speech doesn't fossilize. But we think, think, not know, 
archaeologists think that when we start to see pattern regional variation in artifacts, so differences between the way people made artifacts in, say, North Africa or Eastern Africa or Southern Africa, that this um, these differences start to pattern out in the same sort of way that accents and word choices pattern out. So where I'm from in New England, when we refer to a group of people, we say, you guys. And it's gender neutral. It's just, you know, men, women, it's just you guys. And I gather in the southern part of the country, people say y'all or you all. So it's it's the same thing. It's just it, it has a geographic pattern. Well, we see similar kinds of patterns in the archaeological record in terms of choices people make about how to make stone artifacts or how to make bone tools and these kinds of things. These these pattern differences, um, it's not really clear how far back they go. I think there's a con- kind of a consensus that they that we see credible evidence between uh, you know 200,000 and 300,000 years ago, but uh, it, it grows ever more convincing into more recent time periods. So this is the, the next to the last of our ancestral survival skills. Lastly, hyperprosociality. It's a big word, but it's a pretty simple concept. Basically, hyperprosociality refers to large and stable groups of people that in, in, in those groups in, involve a high cost, buy-in cost. So for college, you college students, it's involved tuition. You know? And not so much in college, although you can see traces of this, that the hyper-pro-social groups entail um, relatively low levels of in-group aggression. So you, know, you tolerate slights and insults from members of your own group and high levels of proactive or out-group aggression. So somebody insults your, 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 your uh, sports mascot, yeah, not a wise idea. <laughs> so, this is a tough one. Now, from the, the fossil evidence, you know, we see a, a, a very marked enlargement of the human brain, uh, the neocortical part of the human brain, about half a million years ago. And in general, large neocortices amongst primates and mammals in general indicate larger social groups, more, more brain to keep track of the social relationships, perhaps. And uh, we also see around the same time evidence for high risk foraging. So people working together to go after large herds of animals rather than individual animals or procuring shellfish at at very low tide lines that can only be predicted from astronomical uh, alignments of the the moon and stars, these sorts of things. Social uh, social media and and artifacts that um, take a lot of time to create to carving, you know, uh, carving bone beads and shell beads and this sort of thing, or using mineral pigments, which take a lot of time to create and, and uh, alter their, their, their uh, appearance by exposing them to fire. These things all start to show up about half a million years ago. Now, here's the thing. All these, these ancestral survival skills, they're in evidence around the time our ancestors first appear, between 200,000 years ago and 300,000 years ago. But this also evidence that other hominins possess them too. So it's not to me possession of these skills that makes a difference. It's what you do with them. So, you know, when I look back, I step back and look from this, I realize, you know, I tell my students, these aren't exotic things. This isn't like how to drink your own pee. Again, don't drink your own pee. <laughs> these are skills you have too. Every single one of you has these skills. You, 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 in fact, you're using them right now, then you'll probably use them, multiple of them, within you know, the next hour after this class ends. So the other thing to remember about this is that incompetence or ignorance of these skills will get you killed. So there are, are, are immediate fitness consequences for ignorance and incompetence about these things. They, they, they're subject to both natural selection and sexual selection. Natural selection are, are things that affect your life and sexual selection are things that affect your ability to reproduce yourself. And of the things Darwin contributed, people often ignore sexual selection. Natural selection is relatively easy to, uh, to understand. Sexual selection is a little more subtle. And what Darwin wrote about sexual selection is, is that this is expressed in conspicuous features and activities, behaviors. Things that, that was very, where there's potential you know, variation and where you know, it, 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 Expressions of adequacy or competence in those you know, activities or, or over the top features like the peacock's tail indicate whether, indicate qualities, mate qualities, whether you're in a, you know, a better or worse potential mate. So any peacock that can get away from a tiger with that sort of tail on them has clearly got something going for them. 
whereas one that, that does not might not. Now, I'd argue that these ancestral survival skills, all the ones I just talked to you about, they're conspicuous activities with potential performance variation. And so they're, therefore, they are logical fo focuses, not just for natural selection, but for sexual selection as well. What I further argue is that demonstrating competence, even excellence in these skills, might have been strategies that our ancestors used as a sexual selection strategy against rival hominins. Now, if you want to, you know, one of the things we, we do in archaeology is we try to base our, our inferences about the past on things we can observe in the present day. And if you look around with reality television, that's what these guys do. They're naked and afraid, survivor man, these kinds of things. These, these are ways that individuals display their, their, their excellence and, and, and competence in, in these survival skills. Now, I've been asked three times to be on, on Naked and Afraid. And I said, my students do need, not need to see my naked, you know, middle-aged butt on, t on national TV. But when I do look at these programs. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, when I look at these television shows, and I'm, in, I'm involved in a lot of behind the camera work, not for this program, for a lot of others. You know, the folks who show up for these shows, they're they're on the make. These are sometimes, you know, they're, they're ex-military or they're folks who want to start a survival school or they, you know, they're using this as a, as a, as basically, you know, as, as a way to branch out and, and to achieve their career goals. That's sexual selection. So if they're doing it today and it works and it works for a lot of these guys, it's, it's reasonable to infer that our ancestors did so too. So I'm going to stop for a moment and, and, and pause to take questions. Anyone have any questions? Of course, my biggest question, uh, you know, that I come up with is, you know, those uh, so, uh, different selections. So, like being able to grasp, right? Um, mm -hmm. Being able to speak. Well, you know, I whales have, you know, what comes really close to language, right? Um, raccoons have the ability to grasp, and so, you know, I think uh, the question I have in the back of my head is, you know, why primates? Um, I've got a feeling that you're going to answer that a little bit more here in a minute. But that was, you know, that was the question that kind of came up. Because there's a lot of other animals, animal types in the animal kingdom that have a lot of those same characteristics. Right? Right. Uh, wolves uh, work very well together most of the time. Um, you know, they have uh, a pack mentality. They they teach their young things, right? And they work together as a group to bring down prey. So, you know, you could think of that as hyper sociality, right? Um, but you know, I said I I always wonder, you know, why primates? Why primates are the ones that seem to have made this leap towards um, sapience, right? Okay, I'll, I'll try. I mean, my, my, my quick reaction is that other animals have bits and pieces of these things, but um, the closer they get to us phylogenetically, the more endangered they become. So, I mean, apes have some of these things. And, you, know, you can teach an ape to make stone tools. You can't teach, teach an ape to, uh, you know, you can teach, they did, actually. They, they, they taught a, a, a ham and eggs, the chimpanzees, to, to uh, be, you know, sit in a, a mercury space capsule. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask the apes to design the mercury space capsule. Mm -hmm. no, the, 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 it, it's not the, the, the mere presence of these things. It's what you do with them and how you integrate them, which I'll get into, into in the next section. You know, it's saying, yeah, okay, raccoons have, have you know, can, can grasp shells and things like this, but raccoons can't drive a screw or pound a nail or program a computer or tell another raccoon how to, how to, how to drive a nail or pound a screw. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not the mere presence of these things. It's, it's, as I'll say in the next section, it's how we integrate them. Does anybody else have any other questions before he continues? Nicole? Oh, did you have a question? No. Okay. Okay. All righty. Back to screen. Back to screen share. All right. Okay. So this gets to your question, Dana, actually. Why us? Now, I'm, I'll argue it's it's two things. It's not one thing. And, and this is the thing about evolution. People always, you know, make these stories, you know, like, like, like you know, 
you know, like uh, Popeye in the spinach can. There's this is this ape, and he you know he comes down from the trees, and he you know he gets chased by lions. And he events fire, and then, and then burns the, the ground, and then you know he becomes the master of the universe. These these, these are stories as old as, as 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 you know written records. I mean, the first work of fiction is is basically a hero story, epic of Gilgamesh. So it's it's not really you know can you construct a story where by the, these different skills arrive in different sequences because you know, the, the, those stories fail the minute somebody finds new evidence. So what I do, what I think we do in survival archaeology is we do a comparative thing. We look and see well, why us? What do we do differently from the other hominids who had these skills? Half a million years ago, if you, excuse me, if you went back 200,000 years ago and looked at the world, you have Neanderthals camped out in Europe and the Middle East, you have Denisovans running around Eastern Asia, you know, a variety of hominids running around Africa, there would be absolutely no reason whatsoever to predict Homo sapiens would be the last hominid standing 12,000 years ago. So we need to look at differences. What, what, what did our ancestors do differently from the other hominids? And the, the, the one thing that really does stand out when you look at these ancestral skills is our ancestors integrated them. They did things that required more than one of those skills to be you know, used simultaneously to create you know, a force multiplier, something different. So in, in the book, I, I focus in on three things, boats, beads, and bows. It's alliterative, but it each stands for a larger thing. Boats, beads, and bows, each of these things requires one to use more than one of those ancestral survival skills simultaneously. If you just rely on one of them, you die. So for example, Let's, let's let's have a look here. So boats. To make a boat, you don't just throw a log in the, in the water. People who do that in in in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa are what we call crocodile food. So a, a well-constructed boat, on the other hand, could essentially turn rivers and and, and ocean barriers into friction-free highways. You know? Do you know in, in Western Africa, rivers that have divided chimpanzee populations for a half a million years? Are now, if you go there today, those rivers are thronging with uh, you know, boats like the one I've shown here in the slide. It was swim, swimming, little ki African kids swimming around under the watchful eyes of their parents. Because again, there's crocodiles. So, you know, boats are a, a huge force multiplier. Without boats, we'd be still be living in Africa. So beads, now beads, beads are social media. Now you think of social media like Facebook and these kinds of things, but you know when, when I travel overseas, you know I work in, in in Kenya, I can immediately tell that, for example, the, the young man and the young woman here, they're Turkana, they're the people with whom we, we we live when we work in the west side of Lake Turkana, and they're not Dasanich or Pokotan or Jems or Nyankatom, the other the other tribes that live nearby. Um, being able to recognize shared characteristics of culture at a distance with beads makes it easier for people to cooperate. And psychological study of a psychological study shows that just perceiving shared cultural beliefs, shared ethics, shared morals, shared religion makes people more generous to one another in, 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 in sort of blind, you know, experiments where you, you know, set people up to kind of share or, or, or defect. Um, bows, bows t t you know, use, you know, uh, stored energy in, in, in wood, and they're a fantastic weapon. They, you can use them to fish, to hunt large animals, to hunt small animals. Um, essentially, you can do all kinds of things and shoot these things in 360 degrees and, and you take down all animals as large as elephants down to, to, to mice So with the same weapon. So they're a versatile weapon that doesn't require one to change one's technology to exploit new, new food resources. You know, people forget about this. Although I gather, you know, bow fishing is increasingly popular out west. That in in before in, in early colonial times in Africa, people hunted with bow. Excuse me, people fished with bows more often. They fished with nets. So these are all all skills. And the interesting thing about them is, admittedly, our evidence for this is kind of dicey. That when we look for first appearance and dates of evidence for these these things for boats beads, and bows, they all appear after the first appearances of our species, Homo sapiens, and before the last appearances of other hominids, so like Neanderthals, Denisovans, and, and the like. So 
So what's going on here? Well, some of my colleagues argue, you know, we could track these ancestral Africans' migrations around Pleistocene Africa of the rest of the world. And I'm skeptical. And the reason I'm skeptical is that I don't think prehistoric humans might, excuse me, I don't think Pleistocene humans migrated. If you look at recent migrations, so Europeans to the New World, or the uh, Mormons to, from, to, to Utah, these migrations involve large groups of people moving together over long distances. So I'm talking hundreds of kilometers. Those recent migrations, they require extra food, overproduction of food, that food to be stored in bulk, and the food to be able to be transported, either using you know, boats or wagons or, or traction animals like oxes and, 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 and horses or cattle and these sorts of things. We don't have any evidence, no affirmative evidence for any of those things, for, you know, for food production, in bulk food storage or traction animals before 12,000 years ago, before the end of the Pleistocene epoch. So I think if you, if you think about it, our Pleistocene ancestors, they weren't migrating, they were dispersing. And by dispersing, I mean small, either individuals or small numbers of people, a family perhaps, you know, moving over, excuse me, short distances, you know, tens of kilometers, and infiltrating other communities. Now, how is this connected up to survival archaeology? Well, in, in the book, which I show the cover later on, I, I, I propose this ancestral infiltrator hypothesis. Now, infiltrator has a negative meaning, but viewed objectively, it simply means that dispersing individuals leverage their ancestral survival skills and their ability to integrate them to advantages of sexual selection in those new communities into which they insert themselves. So a person who knows how to make bows and arrows moves into a community of people who don't, or a person who knows to how, how to make a, and, and use a boat to move across rivers, moves into a community of, of people who are jumping on logs and becoming crocodile food. Now, now this idea that rather than a, a migrating wave of humans waving bows, boats, and, and, and beads over their heads, um, this uh, dispersal hypothesis aligns very well with what we see from the genetic evidence for human dispersal. It, it, it doesn't, for a long time, archaeologists working in Africa, my colleagues would say, oh, well, humans originated here in South Africa, or here in West Africa, or here in East Africa. Not coincidentally, the, the, the folks who are arguing these things usually worked in South Africa, or West Africa, or Eastern Africa. So it's a lot of you know, you know, regional cheerleading. Um, those uh, those ideas that, that humans evolved in one place only have consistently been refuted by both the fossil and genetic evidence. What, what it looks like now is that humans evolved more or less simultaneously, maybe not at the same timing, but across a vast area, across all of Africa and, and potentially parts of Southwestern Asia too. You know, but, but, and this is, makes sense if you think about it in terms of hum, individuals and small numbers of humans moving into, into other hominid communities using their integrated ancestral survival skills and eventually replacing uh, the, the other hominins amongst whom they insert themselves. So long story short, <laughs> our ancestors, one survivor placed to see in Africa and they went on to, to uh, settle the rest of the world, something no other hominin managed to accomplish. So I, I'm gonna dock off the screen sharing momentarily and take any questions you have. Do we have any, have any questions? I love that. I love that idea. I've, I've actually, this, um, something that's really new is, is the idea that it's not this, the out of Africa hypothesis has been with us for a long time, right? That we kind of uh, in bulk sort of moved from Africa uh, into Europe, right? And that, like you're saying, doesn't seem to match up with the genetic evidence, right? It, you just saw... Um, just recently, where there was some more evidence that uh, the Y chromosome uh, for uh, humans is dispersed in a lot of these other uh, human popula or hominid populations, right? So we're, we're basically leveraging our abilities um, for sex. Well, then if you think about it, imagine something happened nowadays. Imagine there's a, a, a mutation evolved 
Um, I, in the book, I call it the skeptic gene. Imagine this mutation evolved and it conferred on those who had it the ability to um, see the absolute truth rather than to listen to, to, to um, you know, put politicians or, 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 you know, supernatural explanations of things. And so if they said, you know, all those Democrats are evil, all those Republicans are evil, the skeptic gene allowed you to say, well, no, that's bullshit. You're just lying. Or, you know, if, if you know, the same gene would allow you to say, well, the, you know, you know, if someone told you the world was created by a giant flying spaghetti monster, this gene allowed you to say, well, no, that's, that's insane. You, you're off your meds. You know, um, People who possess that gene could aggregate one part of the world. We could all say, okay, we've all got this, you know, the skeptic gene. We're all going to move to Uganda. <laughs> that makes us vulnerable. If, if people, you know, really we said, well, okay, look at these guys. The skeptics, they don't believe in the flying spaghetti monster and, and they're Democrats or Republicans. They're all Uganda. Let's get them, you know. That would not help our genes re replicate themselves. Whereas the other strategy of saying, all right, well, we know the flying spaghetti monster is a myth, and we know that the, this politi political party and this other political party are basically different flavors of, of, of uh, Coca-Cola. Let's disperse. If we disperse, we spread our genes around. They can't get us. If they, if they knock out you guys in Uganda, then th those of us in Kenya will be fine. And th if they knock out both Kenya and Uganda, those of us who are in Ukraine will be fine. And if they get the Ukrainians and Kenyans and Ugandas, Ugandans, those of us who are living in the Navajo, will be fine. So you know, it, it's your, in, in your gene's interest to, to spread these, whatever abilities to integrate these survival skills arise from. Um, it's in those genes' interest, anthropomorphizing, to spread them far and wide rather than concentrate them in one, one place. So my, my colleagues, and in, 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 in my friend, my colleagues, I'm not saying they're idiots. They're smart guys. I like them. I've been working with these guys for, for you know, 40 years, you know, it's, they, they, but they had this idea that somebody invented, you know, you know, Bose beads, be, uh, Bose beads, beards? No. <laughs> Bose beads. What was it? Bose, Bose and beads. They invented these things in one place and fanned out as a group. And that, that's just not the way things work unless you have livestock and farms, and pots, and the ability to, and ability to move this stuff in bulk across the landscape, which is what we see in recent times, but it's not a credible you know, model for what, for vision for what happened during the Ice Age. You know, during the Ice Age, climate changed a lot. And so you, you say, ah, oh, this is a nice place to raise wheat, and we'll build a town here, and, and you know, raise cattle, and, and you know, Buffy has a dog, and Fluffy has a, a cat, and this kind of thing. And oh no, a hundred years later, it, it, you, it, it's a, there's a glacier on top of it. So you know, we, we, it's a risk of pro, pro, projecting characteristics of recent time to, into a past that we know is fundamentally different. So you know, I, I think we we we. Uh, we Take this migration idea with which we're familiar and we project it back in time. I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay. My parents came from two different places. My mother's people were these people called Acadians. They were from northern France or Brittany. Um, they, I don't know, they did something, got, got the French got, king got pissed off at them, threw them in boats and shipped them off to Nova Scotia back in the 18th century or 17th century. They, they were migrating. They came as a group. They're still there. Not Nova Scotia so much as the northern Maine. They still, still speak this medieval French, which is truly bizarre. Um, my father's people, they're Irish. You know, they got kicked out of that country for one reason or another across the span of 50 years. Great great grandfather came over around the time of the Civil War and fought in the Civil War. My grandmother came over, you know, 1912, around the time of the Titanic. So they came from different places. They were dispersing. So the dispersal and migration, they can occur at the same time. But what's happened is that you know, paleoanthropologists, they look back at the Pleistocene and say, well, it's migration. But no, actually, the dispersal is the one that's evolutionary primitive. Chimpanzees don't migrate. Baboons don't migrate. Other primates don't migrate. They disperse. They move from, from one group to another. So what we're doing is, is taking a very derived thing, migration, projecting it back in time and, and ignoring the ancestral condition, which is dispersal. Does anybody else have any other questions? All righty. Shall we wrap it up? Yeah. All righty. Uh, share screen.
Okay. So before I get into the conclusion, I want to thank you all. This is what we call the book talk, the talk that my, my editor, Beatrice, says, John, you got to get a book talk together. So when we send you out on publicity tours, you can you can you know present this stuff. And you know, some of the things I, I've talked about today, I'll cut some things. If you share with me ideas later, I'll I'll, I'll maybe add and try to clarify. I, I want to thank you all in advance for, for um your comments and your attention. So it's a funny thing. When I tell my students how to write papers, I always say, you should end your papers like Vladimir Lenin did, but not with the same term. Lenin, you know, uh, used to end his speeches to the Soviets, you know, what must be done? I said, that's passive voice. Use the active voice. What must we do? So so what must we do when we look at, you know, the origins of, and, and dispersal of our species? So, well, one thing is we can keep playing, p playing pin the tail of the donkey. It's fun. It's definitely funny. If you have little kids, it's, it's, you know, put on earplugs, it's, it's, it's great. You know, we can keep arguing about which of these hominids we've made, which stone tool industries, and we can keep drawing arrows on maps to trace these migrations that never happened. Fine. If you got the spare, if, if, if you got the free time, fine. I mean, donkey, pin, donkey pinning is fun, but it doesn't advance human origins research very much. And it's not really like anybody's going to make fun of you for I'm lying. Of course, I'm going to make fun of you every time. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> um, survival archaeology, I think, offers a better way forward. So rather than, you know, like Timmy here, pinning the tail, you know, the, the stone artifact tail on the wrong hominid, we can move forward and make progress. And what I think survival ar archaeology offers another way, a different path. It investigates the origins and evolution of these survival skills. I don't think I'm, I'm not like, like like Chomsky. I think syntax emerged just like you know like that. I think you know these skills evolved, and there's, what we really do need to do is, is not just assume this is the benchmark date and they and they occurred. We assume they are fully formed thereafter. We need to try to figure out out, out of what primate behavior substrate did these things evolve. Now, by method. Rather than trying to tell a little story about how they got fire and then they got stone tools and they suddenly woke up one day and knew how to finger paint the walls of the caves, I think we have to we should use our comparator approach. What we should do is assemble the evidence for these skills in different regions or different time periods, compare them, and try to develop hypotheses about why those differences exist. The next step, of course, is as a scientist, we try to knock down as many of those hypotheses or prove them wrong. And then whittle them down to the, the, the small number that, that remain, and then work to find ways of proving those, those hypotheses wrong. And this ancestral infiltrator hypothesis is just one. It's an hypothesis. I'm, it's, it's not, you know, if, if it gets proved wrong tomorrow, I'll fine, I'll go on. Be, something better will replace it. But it's an hypothesis. It's something we can prove wrong rather than an argument, which we can't prove wrong. So in survival archaeology work, I hope so. <laughs> I spent the last three years writing a book about it. So uh, the, the book, the Unstoppable Human Species book, comes out uh, later this month in, in March. It's a proof of like, a proof of concept. I, I don't do any of this business of you know these these hominids made these tools. They wandered over the Himalayas through this mountain pass. It's simply a, a, a study of what changes in survival strategies humans might have needed to uh, to move from Africa to Eurasia from Southern Asia to Northern Asia, and that's on to the New World, and the Pacific Islands. Um, it's a proof of concept. And, you know, I, I put it out there. We'll see what happens. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that, you know, that, that, that you know, years from now, almost everything in the book will be proven wrong, but that's that's how science works. We, we you know, we, we learn by proving things wrong, not by comfortably assuring us that our arguments are correct. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have, have a question for Professor Shea? Goodness, that was a lot to take in, John. Um, like they and they read the paper beforehand, and that was a that was a lot to take in. So thank you so very much. Did we get any questions on the on the Facebook? Okay. We just sort of have no idea how many people are in the live stream or on Facebook right now. So um, I had um, something like 40 people say that they would attend this event probably uh, via uh, the live stream. So 
Um, there was probably quite a few people watching. So just thank you so much, John, uh, for being with us tonight. Um, this is this is science, people. This is cutting edge science right here. We're on the cutting edge research on, on a different hypothesis. And like you said, it's something that we can actually test and prove incorrect, right? We can prove, we can prove it not true, right? Because you can't prove things to be true, right? I talked about this in class quite a bit. And you can't prove things, right? We don't, we, we don't do that in science. We have to prove it wrong. Right? So that's what he wants you to do. Read this book and prove him wrong. Right? That's, that's, that's science. Daniel, I'll ask, I'll ask them to do one more thing. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's, it, this is from the, the previous book, the Africa, the East African Stone Tools book. It's, it's the last thing I tell my students. Is, uh, always work as hard as you can. Never quit. Mm -hmm. that's, Never quit. That's the most important survival lesson ever. Mm -hmm. Don't quit. You know, work as hard as you can, never quit. You'll get where you, you deserve to be. Awesome. Thank you so much, John, for being with us. You're I, welcome. Just so I'm just so very grateful. I really appreciate it. Look forward to your book. Yes. <laughs> right? All right. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night.